This week, some Canadian doctors renewed the call for a national drug plan, saying it would save billions of dollars. But just what is the state of prescription drug use in this country? Our national checkup panel is here to help. Danielle Martin is a family physician with Women's College Hospital. Samir Sinha is the director of geriatrics at Mount Sinai and University Health Network Hospitals. Kara Tannenbaum is a geriatric physician and pharmacy chair at the Université de Montréal. And David Henry is a professor in the Dalalana School of Public Health at the University of Toronto. Their thoughts in a moment, but first, some background. How many of these are in our everyday lives? When asked, 41% of Canadians said they'd taken some kind of prescribed drug over the previous two days. From asthma to depression, it's a lot of drugs for a lot of different reasons. And in our aging society, it's the elderly who use the most. 70% are on more than one medication. What we're paying right now, it's like a small mortgage. All that medicine isn't cheap either. Canadians spent an estimated $22 billion a year on prescriptions in 2013, almost twice what they spent in 2001. And one in 10 struggle to afford it. It's big business and big drug companies know it. Spending billions marketing it right back to you. Ask your doctor if Lunesta is right for you. So are we over or under medicated? Is the high cost of prescription drugs failing to help Canadians in need? And what should we be watching for next? So we'll start with that middle question, like uh, who is not covered? Who is falling through the cracks? You must all see this in your practices. Danielle, what are you seeing? In fact, millions of Canadians have no drug coverage whatsoever and millions more don't have adequate coverage for their needs. In my practice, I see it all the time uh, among the self-employed. Uh, or people who are working in small businesses, people who are working part-time and don't have employer-based coverage. It's the taxi drivers, it's the people who are working in a part-time job, but it's also middle-income people who are consultants or working in small businesses who don't have coverage. So this isn't just a problem for the poor, it's a problem for people across socioeconomic lines. It's funny, you know, you, we hear our health plan discussed in the United States and they talk about our socialized medicine. You sort of, until you have a health problem, you assume everything's covered, but who falls through the cracks that you see, Samir? Yeah, I mean, I treat a lot of older patients and those who are 65 and older generally are covered by a provincial drug plan. But, you know, I'm seeing more and more, especially after the recent recession, where we have people who are closer to that age who lose their jobs. And if they lose their jobs and they were relying on private drug coverage for their work plans, they're not covered. Um, and then they find themselves can't afford their medications, they get sicker, and it's, they literally have to wait and be sick until they can actually get their medications. What are you saying, David? I think this is right, and it's a surprise to somebody from outside of Canada to find that a, in a country with a good comprehensive care system, there is not drug coverage. So patients with chronic disease and, for instance, diabetics, Ironically, in the city where insulin was discovered, are relying on free handouts from their physicians to provide what is really an essential medication that's keeping them alive. What, uh, who do you think is falling through the cracks? What are you seeing? A vulnerable population in my mind are older adults with multiple medical conditions who are taking 5, 10, 15 medications at the same time and have to pay the deductible on that. And that adds up for a lot of them who don't have a lot of money to begin with. So they start making choices about, will I take my drugs till the end of the month? Will I take every single medication that I have to? Do I really need those three medications for my high blood pressure or can I let one go? And that could have effects on their health. Well, you mentioned diabetes, uh, David. We heard earlier on The National this week from a woman in, in BC. Uh, she has diabetes. It's a life-threatening disease if it's not looked after. And this is what she said. Roughly about six to eight hundred bucks a month. I don't get any help until I spend at least thirty five hundred a year and then they'll kick in, you know, whatever portion they decide to cover. So, so David, that's really common. People on diabetes aren't fully covered? Well, they're covered to a degree in BC, but it's the it's what we call the co-payment level that they have to make, even under an insurance program. In Ontario, they don't have any insurance at all. They're going to pay the full market price if they don't have insurance through their employer, mm. and they may lose that 
if, if they're out of work. What are you seeing? What's not covered? Give me an example. Well, actually, one thing that I think is surprising to a lot of people is the variability in coverage among public drug plans in Canada. So something that's covered, if, even if you're, if you're covered under a public drug plan, for example, if you have cancer and you have to take chemotherapy outside of the hospital, in many Canadian provinces, that's taken care of. In Ontario, for example, it's not. And I think that many Canadians are surprised to discover, imagine that, you know, enormous stress of a cancer diagnosis that on top of that, uh, you're going to have to pay uh, out of pocket at, at least to, to, to very, uh, sometimes to very, very high levels, in mm. fact. And even just the other day, I was I just uh, was debating with the pharmacy about the cost of some vitamin D. I have a person who's under house; he's on social assistance, um, and they they said that we'll give you a free blister pack, you know, so he can store his meds. We'll give you this, and we were actually you know, working out a pricing system so this guy could even afford something so that he wouldn't break bones and and and, and actually have a fracture down the road. So, it's amazing how some of the basic things we we think are important aren't even covered. Hmm. Well, we saw that the drug costs have almost doubled in the last 11, 12 years. Is part of the problem that there's only so much, it seems, money to, to go around for prescription drugs? Is, is part of the problem that there's too many, some drugs are too easily available while people who really need them are, are not getting them? And is marketing playing into that? We see a lot of ads uh, in the last 10 years. Check this out. We know a place where tossing and turning have given way to sleeping, where sleepless nights yield to restful sleep, and Lunesta can help you get there. Anyone with high cholesterol may be at increased risk of heart attack. I stopped kidding myself. Talk to your doctor about your risk. Ask your doctor if Lunesta is right for you. You make a great team, but your erectile dysfunction? It could be a question of blood flow. Ask your doctor about Cialis for daily use in a 30-tablet free trial. I don't think anyone wants to make jokes about erectile dysfunction. I mean, people do have needs, but is there, is there, well, maybe Carol, I'll come to you. Are there too many drugs that are too easily available as opposed to the other problem of drugs that should be available and aren't? I think it's a question of appropriateness and when is it appropriate to be taking a medication for something and when are we chemically coping with our life. We just saw an ad for one of a, a sleeping pill. Is it realistic to think that everyone should be able to sleep 12 hours per night? I think that there's a lot of myths around sleep. I think that we look at sleep to, you know, instead of mindfulness, instead of dealing with our anxieties, and should we really be taking a sleeping pill when it causes memory problems, when it could lead to falls in the elderly, when there's recent research showing that it increases the risk of Alzheimer's disease? Is that an appropriate use of a sleeping pill? And that's a question that we really have to ask when we talk about quality of life and the harms of certain medications too. Danielle, is, is, is the pot not divided properly? Well, I think it, it may, it's probably not divided properly. And I also think that we need to be very mindful of the, um, the ways in which advertising and marketing, whether it's direct to patients or consumers as we often consume from the American media on our television screens, or whether it's direct to physicians. So, you know, in fact, even in the US under the uh, Affordable Care Act, physicians are now required to declare any amount of money that they take from the pharmaceutical industry. We have no such sunshine law here in Canada. Don't Canadian patients want to know if your doctor has had their vacation or their last meal or their speaker's fees paid by the company uh, that makes the drug they've just prescribed for you? Well, we saw in those ads, they all say, ask your doctor. Um, right. Is there a lot of pressure and is that contributing to the number of pills on the market, Simeon? Well, it's a huge amount of pressure. I think, you know, for if, you know, if you're a doctor that relies on information or supports from pharmaceutical representatives, for example, then there is that pressure that you're put under. There's that influence that you have. But also, we know that if your patient asks you specifically specifically and says, you know, what about this medication? You may say, well, oh, it's easier to prescribe you that medication. That's what you really want. But there's actually five things you can do to improve your sleep and actually avoid being on that medication. But we don't get ads for that. But I want to be like that. the lady with the wings. And that's what I hear. <laughs> I, why, can I, why can't I be like that? But I think it's important to think about the other options. David, what do you think? I'd like to focus a little bit on the prices that are being paid. We've talked about usage and whether yep. drug use is appropriate. There's also the price that is paid. Canvas paying too much. And if we can just return for a second or two to the idea of a national program, there's a huge advantage 
in being the sole purchaser on behalf of 35 million people, as it would be with a national program in Canada. And we know from experience you can reduce drug prices by 30-40%. That's billions of dollars a year. That's a political debate that you've launched and I uh, hope that it uh, gets mm. taken up by the politicians. The, uh, who, who is buying these drugs? So we, we've so seen that there are more people uh, having trouble getting drugs, more people using drugs. Who, who is it? that are taking prescription drugs yeah. in Canada? Well, you know, interestingly, over the last uh, decade, we've seen an increase in prescription drug use in every single age category. So the answer is we all are. We're all taking more drugs than our, our you know, equivalent people did a decade ago. And I teenagers. think- Teenagers. Te absolutely, teenagers and, uh, you know, the elderly and everybody in between. And so the question really becomes, uh, are we ever any healthier as a result? You know, in some cases, we're talking about truly life-saving treatment that are medical breakthroughs. And of course, we all want to see every Canadian have unfettered access to those important treatments. In other cases, we may actually be talking about overdiagnosis, overprescription, uh, and as you say, Kara, sort of chemical coping of all different kinds. And that's, I think that's what we need to kind of get at and try to tease out. Well, and the largest group of all uh, on prescription drugs right now, Kara, are, are the seniors. Uh, the seniors, yes, and I'm very passionate about this topic because sometimes I see patients come into my office on 23 different drug classes, and that's when we don't talk about what drugs should we add, but what drugs can we take away, and the concept of deprescribing. And imagine if we could get people who are on unnecessary drugs, because as you get older, you get added this drug and a second drug, and this specialist gives you this, and that specialist gives you that, but then there start to be interactions between the different drugs that could cause side effects and hospitalizations. And maybe it's time to start asking, well, what's the right drug for you at this time, at this age, with these medical conditions? And personalized medicine is something that we've been talking about. It would be nice if we could introduce that conversation into therapy and not just drug therapy, but all therapy. Maybe the drug isn't needed. Maybe physiotherapy is needed or a psychologist or better exercise or nutrition. So I think it's really a bigger question. Samir? It's, it's exactly. I mean, in my clinic the other day, I had a patient who was on eight medications when she came with me. And this is a senior. You deal with seniors as well. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and when she left my office, she was thrilled because she was only on two medications, mainly because some of the medications were being prescribed to treat the side effects of, of, um, of other medications, for example, or the indications for those medications were no longer valid in her. Um, but we added some vitamins and we, we just balanced things out appropriately. And she was thrilled because as Cara was saying before, um, the co-pays, the other payments that one needs to pay for medications you don't want to take, that's a problem as well. We're going to take a short break, but we have uh, one more discussion area, which are what are the next challenges that Canadians might face with prescription drugs? We'll be right back. Welcome back to our national checkup panel. Danielle Martin, Samir Sinha, Kara Tannenbaum, and David Henry are all here to talk about the next frontier. So we're hearing all of this exciting news. Science marches on, and there's all of these new drugs, new treatments. Everyone wants them, or everyone who needs them wants them, but they're expensive, right, Danielle? They can be extremely expensive. So what, you know, what we call these blockbuster drugs coming out onto the market, some of them truly do represent breakthroughs in medical treatment, and in some cases they can cost tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. Uh, so they really are very expensive. But what I think many people may not realize is that the number of drugs coming out, even the expensive ones that are truly breakthroughs, is still a very small portion of the drugs coming out on the market. Many, many drugs that are being released and are expensive are, are marginally, if at all, really any better than their predecessors. So just because it's new and fancy and costs a lot doesn't necessarily mean that it's all that much better. Mm -hmm. So what's gonna happen, David? We need to find a plan. Uh, these drugs may cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. Nobody can afford that individually. Tens of thousands, rich people can afford them, but the average person cannot. So there's really no way we can cope with these unless we've got a plan. And I, I, in my view, it has to be a national plan. And the advantages of that are that when you're buying or you're subsidizing on behalf of 35 million people, you're going to get better prices. And your insurance pool that covers these costs is much greater. So the country can afford drugs that individuals can. Samir, what do you see as the new frontier here? 
I think you know, the new frontier is going to be more personalized treatments in terms of how do we how do we actually treat cancers, how do we treat um, certain uh, rare conditions with more personalized treatments. Because it's very exciting, right? You have this mm -hmm. cancer that's not that common, and then you hear that there's a treatment for it, and you want and it. It. <laughs> and it, and it, and it. And it has the possibility of alleviating a lot of suffering from unnecessary treatments that may not actually be... Uh, um, you know, be effective. But I think this is the challenge. If we want to be able to afford these, if we actually work together, we're actually more able to afford them when we bulk buy these medications. But the key is going to be that, you know, this is where the future is going, and we're going to have to figure out a way to pay for it. Hmm. What are you uh, looking forward to? I'm really looking forward to seeing all of these new treatments that we've spent decades researching. Do you know what the investment in health research has been in order to find new car targets for drugs, in order to increase quality of life, in order to cure cancer, and then to send a message, oh, sorry, we're not going to give them to you, or you can't afford to pay for them, then I think there's a lack of consistency in the messaging that we're giving to Canadians around equity for health care. So you could get your diagnosis, and you could see a physician, but we may not be able to afford treating you. So I think this is something we need to think about. It's very exciting. I think we live in exciting times and looking at different funding strategies to make sure that people get the appropriate care that they need at the right time to improve their health is really what we're going to be looking forward to. Tricky though, huh? It's a, it's a provincial jurisdiction. You've got to get all the provinces to agree to a, a list and the list is getting longer and... Absolutely. I mean, I think actually one of the big myths out there about, about drug plans is that higher quality plans are the ones that cover everything. And in fact, that's not true. You know, we can use a national plan or a pan-Canadian plan or whatever you want to call it to, to target our prescribing and guide our prescribing in order to make it more appropriate. And that's another way that we're going to save money in the long run. Well, I learned a lot tonight. I hope uh, our audience did too. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you.